Good morning, His people. Welcome to church. It's so wonderful to have you joining us. And uh, we are busy with a series entitled Awesome God. And this is part four of the series. And this series, what is this series all about? Well, in this series, we are looking at places in the Bible where people have encountered God. But what we are particularly looking to draw out of these encounters that people have had with God is what revelation, what understanding, what insight they got of who God is by how they, how they named God, the response they gave to God uh, in, in, in how they named him. And so this is part four. And uh, won't you come with us as we look at um, this morning's topic, which is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And that's literally what the Hebrew means. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord who provides, the God who provides. And once again, the, the, remember, these names for God were names the Hebrew people gave to God because this is who he was. This is how they experienced him. And so it's so rich, it's so deep to, to study these portions of Scripture and to get an understanding of who God is. And our Scripture that we're going to be looking at is the Scripture in Genesis chapter 2 uh, from 1 to 19. And it is where Abraham is tested. That's a little heading in my Bible. Abraham is tested. And many of you will, will, will know the story quite well where the Lord tells Abraham to take his son Isaac up Mount Moriah and to build an altar and to sacrifice him. And, and, and you know the story where the Lord provides the ram that is caught in the thicket. And, and it's in that moment that Abraham um, uh, gets the revelation that God is a provider. And he says, and he, and he, and he says the words Jehovah Jireh. And so that's a brief summary, but it is such a rich story. And I want to start by just putting up a little quote by Charles Spurgeon. And this is his commentary about this, or part of his commentary about this portion of Scripture. So Charles Spurgeon, who was known as the Prince of, Pre uh, of Preachers uh, in England in, in, uh, quite a few years ago. There are times with us when we are called to a course of action which looks as though it would jeopardize our highest hopes. And this is his commentary on the story of Abraham sacrificing his son. This is the son of promise. This is the son through which this offspring, this inheritance, these, these multitudes are meant to come. Yeah, the Lord is asking him to sacrifice the very, the very means, the very promise. And so sometimes, hey, this doesn't make sense. It is neither your business nor mine to fulfill God's promise, nor to do the least wrong to produce the greatest good, to do evil, that good may come, is false morality and a wicked policy. For us is duty, for God is the fulfillment of his own promise for us, his duty. And I've been thinking about the story of Abram and Isaac and this, and this encounter with God at this altar. And this, 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 this story has become so, so synonymous with, with in our lives. And, and I thought, let me tell you a story just about how this story um, has come to mean a lot to us, to Jenny and I. And I want to say, firstly, you know, when we think about the story, the two main characters in the story, Abram and Isaac, absolutely it is a picture of what happened at the cross of Calvary. It is a picture of what Jesus, what happened to Jesus at Calvary. And the symbolism and the prophetic uh, just typology in this in this portion of scripture pointing towards Calvary is so rich. It's so hard not to think about Calvary, to think about the cross when, when we read the story. But 
and, and many of the commentaries that I've read and, and looked at about this, they, that, that, that's where they point. And it is true and it's beautiful. But, you know, sometimes we can just look at Scripture with, with a bit of an intellectual approach. And, and it's brilliant to see all the, all the typologies. But Scripture is meant to be applied to our personal lives. And, you know, for Jenny and I, there, are there have been times in our lives where we have so identified with Isaac, literally being on the altar and literally surrendering our all to the Lord. And there are times and have been times in our lives where we have been able to identify with Abram in the story, where we are bringing precious things in our lives, uh, valuable things, and we are placing them on the altar. And, and both of those, we go through seasons in our life where we just know that is what is required of us. And, and, and I, last year, I actually ministered a word entitled, The Beautiful Life, The Surrendered Life. And I, and I believe the story of Abram and Isaac and this, and this encounter with God at the altar is just the reality of the Christian life. I don't believe that we should ever move too far away from from having that place, having an altar in our lives, a place of surrender, a place where we are reminded that that our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price, and and surrendering our lives to the Lord is just is just normal Christianity. This isn't for super saints who lived, you know, many years ago. Um, this is just normal Christianity, and so and so for Jen and I. Um, you know, when Charles Spurgeon says there are times with us when we are called to a course of action which looks as though it would jeopardize our highest hopes. Folks, there are times that, that we've been through situations like that. About 20 years ago, uh, we, we were asked to take over a His People Church in Austria, Salzburg, Austria. And we prayed about it, and, and we felt that this was the Lord. And so, and so we did what was required to, to I resigned my job as a, as a professional engineer. Um, we sold our home in Port Elizabeth, and we were asked to move down to Cape Town for, for a season of training. We had, we had our two little girls. Uh, they were aged, I think, one and three. And, and we laid it all down. We, we, we got rid of all our stuff, and we moved down to Cape Town just with a few suitcases. We'd been married for about, uh, I mean, yeah, a good few years, about eight years at that stage. And it was a big sacrifice. It was a big sacrifice. It was literally a case of we felt that we're getting onto the altar, and we are just surrendering all to the Lord. And, you know, after a few months, long story, I'm not going to go into the details, didn't work out. We never, we never moved to Austria. We never went. And long story, the Lord opened up after a few years uh, for us to come to Peter Maritzburg and plant a church in Peter Maritzburg. And, and it was a very confusing time. It was, a, it was a difficult time. But we look back now, Jen and I look back, and we are like, sure, Lord, you tested us. It was, a, it was, it was an intense time of testing. But the Lord had this beautiful city in South Africa called Peter Maritzburg. And you know, when, when, when Austria didn't work out, in one sense, we were obviously very disappointed. But in another sense, it was like, wow, we get South Africa back. We get the beautiful people that we've grown to love. We get this amazing multicultural nation. This is where we get to live and bring up our family and 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 grow and thrive and and enjoy and in many ways it was it was like we got onto the altar and the lord said we see, i see your willingness to surrender all you can you can have it back like isaac getting off the altar and so and so this this picture of Abraham and Isaac has just been very real to Jen and I. This isn't some dusty old Bible story that, 
that, um, you know, kind of you heard when you were at Sunday school. This is real stuff. And the Lord often will call us to lay precious things on the altar. Our precious, beautiful His People Church in Peter Maritzburg, the Lord has often asked us to put it on the altar. And we do so willingly. And we just so delighted time and time again. The Lord has given it back to us and said, carry on leading. Your season is not over. And so and so this is this is this is a real a real heart story for us. So as we dig into the story, I wanted to just introduce it to you like that. That I don't know what encounter with God um he's leading you into or maybe you in i think many people would be able to say that it has been a very testing season and 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 yeah a testing season is is very often it's time on the altar but it's an amazing story of how god provided i am sure abraham and isaac never had a clue of how how the story was going to turn out and isn't it so true with so many of the tests we go through in life? We don't know how it's going to turn out. But when when we trust in God and we desiring to please Him, it always ultimately will bring glory to Him. And, and that's just our greatest delight. So let's go on. And so we kick off in the story in Genesis uh, chapter 22 verse 1 to 19. And let's read together. After these things... God tested Abraham. Okay, it's, that's that's w- the words of the Bible. God tested Abraham, and it's it's also an introduction that, hey, this is a test. So so the outcome is is not necessarily as you may think it's going to be. But I want to say about a test. A very important thing about a test is, remember, just think about all the tests you've been through in life. The purpose of a test is to reveal things. The purpose of a test is most importantly to reveal what's inside of the student. And I want to submit to you that this test, just like any test, it's not for God to see what's inside of us. He knows. It's that we can see what's inside of us. Hey, and sometimes you know you write a test and it's not that good. And I want to submit to you, it's not a bad thing that sometimes we see the not nice stuff. I've been through seasons in my life where I just feel, I've just felt like, oh God, you just, he's just cleansing and he's challenging and he's cleansing and he's washing and he's burning and he's cleansing and it's, it's beautiful. It's not always the nicest, but hey, that's what tests are. Tests reveal some stuff you don't know, stuff that you thought you knew, but it also does reveal a lot of stuff that God has placed inside of you. Um, it reveals the good stuff as well. And so I really want to just um, invite you on this this little test and reflect on it for your own life. It says, And after these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Verse 2, He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac. I just underlined that, your only son, because remember last week we looked at the story of Hagar and Ishmael. And yes, Abram did have another son. But at this point in Abram's life, um, Hagar and Ishmael have actually, have actually left them. And so, yes, biologically, he does have a son, but the son is not in his life. And there's no indication that he, that he ever saw Ishmael again. May have, Bible just doesn't highlight it. And so for practical purposes, um, Isaac is his only son. And he actually says this, your only son, three times in this portion of Scripture. And you'll see, I'll highlight it for you. But can you see, do you hear the prophetic ring to Jesus, the Son of God, the only Son of God? And so, and so the, once again, when you read the story and, and you know the cross and Calvary and what Jesus did, you're just hearing and you're just seeing the prophetic picture pointing towards what, what, what 
Jesus did at Calvary. And again, remember, Abram was in covenant with God. And, and, and I heard one time just a beautiful explanation of covenant that because of what Abram did here, it provided the covenantal framework and uh, in the spirit for what, what Jesus did at Calvary. And it's just such a beautiful story. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. And again, I've underlined whom you love there. Because the law of first mention, do you know that this is the first time that the word love is mentioned in the Bible? If you look from Genesis 1 and you read through, you'll find that the first time. And look at the context in which this love is speaking. It's talking about the, the love between a father and a son. And again, we get a glimpse of the love the father has for his son, Jesus. And just we're reminded that this is the, this is, this is the fountainhead of all love is the love that we see in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And go to the land of Moriah. I've un underlined Moriah. And um, uh, if, you, if you just study the, the, the geography and history over here, we understand that Moriah is actually the mountains around Jerusalem. And many Bible scholars actually believe that the place that God led Abraham to, to sacrifice and build the altar and put Isaac on, on, on the altar was the same place that he would, thousands of years later, sacrifice his son. The place where Jesus died on the cross. It's incredible. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And the scripture goes, goes on. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. I want to just highlight on the third day, you know, from when God first told him what needed to do, this journey took them three days. And we know it was on the third day that he actually, he actually built the altar, put Isaac on the altar. And that's when um, the angel of the Lord stopped him and he saw the ram in the thicket. But it was only when at that moment when, when, when the angel stopped him and said, don't do it. There's the ram in the th sh thicket. At that moment... Isaac was resurrected in Abraham's eyes and heart. From when God told him what he needed to do for those three days, Isaac was figuratively already sacrificed. And so again, on the third day, we know that's what happened at Calvary. Three days. And again, the prophetic picture just boom, boom, boom. You just see it pointing towards Calvary. But what's interesting, it says, that he, Abraham, cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Abram was a wealthy man. If we read in Scripture, he had many servants. Uh, at this stage in his life, he, he was really wealthy. He could have, at the click of a finger, got a whole bunch of servants to cut wood for him. But here he is. He is, he's well over 100 years now because Isaac has been born, as we know, when he was 99. Isaac was born. And here he is cutting the wood. And what's, what's going on over here? You know, it's so interesting that the reality is that this life of surrender, this life of, um, yeah, of sacrifice, it's not just something that we expect to do when we first come to Christ and surrender our lives to the Lord. This reality of living a surrendered life is something we, we do. And I want to submit to you that as we mature in God, it is our delight to live even more surrendered and, and, even, and sacrifice even more. Here he is cutting the wood for the burnt offering. It's, it's just an amazing picture. Also, 
It's just his desire to please God fully, to please God fully. He went to the place of which God had told him. So I, I actually want to just tie this in with a scripture in John 21. Now, this is the story where Jesus basically restores Peter. Remember, Peter denied him three times. And three times Jesus comes to him and restores him with the words, feed my sheep. And what does Jesus say after this? He says, Jesus said in John 21, verse 17 to 19, he said, Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then he says, I'm telling you the very truth now. When you were young, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wished. But when you get old, you'll have to stretch out your hands while someone else dresses you and takes you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, he said this to hint at the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he commanded, follow me. You know what's amazing is that he's, Jesus is prophesying here to Peter and telling him about when you are older, he says, others will take you where you do not want to go. Folks, what does that speak about? That speaks about a surrendered life. That speaks about a life of sacrifice. Now, we, we, we know the legend of, of, of how Peter was actually crucified. He didn't want to be crucified the same way as his Lord. And he begged that they would actually crucify him upside down. But this, this, this little portion of scripture that I underlined takes you where you don't want to go. This is the great Apostle Peter. This is, this is at the end of his life. And I just want to submit to you. That this reality of living a, a surrendered life, a life of sacrifice, is not meant to be just something you do, you know, kind of when you give your heart to the Lord. This is just how we live. And there, there are some significant sacrifices and that the Lord calls us to make that doesn't, as, as it says over here, takes you where you don't want to go. It may not be something that you want to do. Hey. But we didn't sign up to serve the king and his kingdom because it's all about what we want to do. The glory of it is we get to live for what he wants us to do. And it's just so beautiful. And the, the word follow me. Remember, these are the words with which the disciples were called. And here, right at the end of the book of John, the Lord is still telling them, follow me. Following Jesus isn't something you do just in the beginning. This is what we do. Let's go on to Abram's story. It says in verse 5, Then Abram said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Interesting that uh, Abram knows what the Lord has, says, has said, but he defines it as worship. Folks, a surrendered life. A life of sacrifice is a life of worship. Worship involves sacrifice. Worship is sacrifice. And so, and so this is what it's about. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. He laid it on Isaac his son. Think of the cross. Think of Via Dolorosa, the road that Jesus walked with the cross of Calvary. He carried the wood exactly as Isaac did over here. And it says both of them together. You know what's interesting? Many Bible scholars believe that Isaac wasn't a little boy. He was a man. Some scholars actually believe that he may have been in his early 30s, same age as Jesus. And again, the prophetic significance is just huge here. And that, but what the Bible is saying, both of them together, it's not just that they're walking together. It literally means they were in unity. So Isaac knew. Isaac was in total agreement. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew what God was requiring of them and of him. It's just amazing. And I want to say this, you know, this story, I, being a father, having children, 
is just one of the greatest delights. And uh, a couple of years ago, there was a book called The Shack that came out. And everybody was reading it. And um, I was also kind of encouraged to read it. And I, I heard basically the story outline. And, and I heard that. And, and uh, I realized actually when I started reading it that ch in chapter 2, um, the writer experiences a tragedy, loses loses his daughter, and that's kind of a, just a metaphor of, and the whole book is about him receiving healing from the Lord because of this. But obviously, it's also the metaphor of Father God losing his son and and how the Lord ministers to this guy. But I just could not, I could not get myself to read that chapter i tried a number of times i just couldn't get myself to it and so that makes this 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 sentence so they both so they went both of them together that they were in agreement knowing exactly what the lord was asking them remember at this stage they didn't know there would be a ram in the thicket etc and the question of course is 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 yeah what was what was going on in their hearts what was going on in their minds? And um, just to, in my notes I've put up here, we have a remarkable picture of the work of Jesus at the cross thousands of years before it happened. The Son of Promise willingly went to be sacrificed in obedience to his Father, carrying the wood of his sacrifice up the hill, all with a full confidence in the promise of resurrection. With full confidence in the promise of resurrection. Why do we say that? Why did I put this in, 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 in the notes? Well, if we look at the book of Hebrews, uh, the, the faith chapter, chapter 11, there's just three verses where the writer of Hebrews just brings amazing biblical insight regarding some of what was going on in the background. What was Abraham thinking? What were they believing would God do, was, was God going to do uh, through this whole, this whole drama that's unfolding? And look at what Hebrews 11 says, verse 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Verse 19, this is it. Abram reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead, back from death. And so, and this is what's going on. They were walking believing that God would perform a resurrection. And the amazing thing is, there is no, it hasn't ha hadn't happened in history. There's no account, account of any resurrection happening before. But that was their faith. That was what th they were believing God for. And we knew it happened at Calvary. And, and the, uh, Jesus resurrected uh, uh, three days later after Calvary, sh uh, should I say. But, this is what Abram and Isaac were believing as they were walking up that mountain. It's, it's amazing. Let's go on with the story. And Isaac said to his father, Abram, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Uh, verse 8. Abram said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. This is incredible. Can you see, again, the prophetic nature of what Abraham is saying over here? God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went together again in agreement let's go on when they came to the place of which god had told him abram built the altar there 
and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abram reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. Oh, wow. So, what I, what I just wanted to also highlight is that, you know, obviously in our modern culture, we read a story like this, and we kind of think, whoa, you know, uh, human sacrifices, this is a bit weird. But remember, in those days, um, the cultures around them, this was common practice. And so, to, to, to people in that day, this was like, okay, this is what's required. But look what it says. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And so, again, yeah, the Lord is revealing to us that what was in Abram's heart. He said, I know that you fear God. That was a strong motivation. Why did he get up so early that morning? Why did he, was he, he the one who was chopping the wood and getting it all sorted out? Because he feared God. And again, you didn't withhold your son, your only son. Second time that word is, that only son is recurring. Again, prophetically pointing to Jesus. And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold him was a ram. So I want to say also, you know, the Lord reiterates further in Scripture a number of times that that human or child sacrifice is an abomination to him. And so nowhere in Scripture does God actually require this. And it was something that, that God said was detestable to him in, in the other nations around, around the Hebrew people. And let's just go on. It says here, and I'm just putting this up in my notes. Abram had to learn the difference between trusting the promise and trusting the promise, sir. I know that's not proper English word, but you understand, capital P. We can put God's promise before God himself and feel it's our responsibility to bring the promise to pass, even if we have to disobey God to do it. Trust the promiser no matter what, and the promise will be taken care of. Trust the promiser no matter what, and the promise will be taken care of. You know, just reflecting on our story of you know, not going to Austria and ending up in Peter Maritzburg. You know, we we didn't know how the story would turn out. Looking back 20 years later, we so delighted with how the story turned out. We so delighted that we can serve God in the beautiful city of Peter Maritzburg in South Africa. And and again, we are trusting the promiser no matter what, and the promise will be taken care of. Remember, it's faith in God. That's what it's about. So what happens? Let's go on. It says, it says, it speaks about a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abram went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14 is the key. So Abram called the name of that place the Lord will provide and that is the the, the 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 hebrew words that he used is jehovah jireh the lord will provide is jehovah jireh as it is said to this day on the mount of the lord it shall be provided on the mount of the lord it shall be provided i'm just underlining that again the lord provided himself the sacrifice at calvary remember in Romans 3.23, it says the wages of sin is death. 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The wages of sin is death. And so either we can take those wages or we can, can acknowledge that God provided a way and that Jesus took the wages of our sin at Calvary. On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The Lord has provided a way that you and I don't have to carry the weight of our sin into eternity. And we can, we, can, we can surrender our life to Christ and give our burdens to Him and ask His forgiveness and ask Him to cleanse us of all our wrongdoing. And that is what He does. And that, at that moment, we are gloriously born again. And that is how the Lord has provided. He has provided. That is our Jehovah Jireh. The amazing thing is that it is in a story of incredible testing, incredible incredible trial that Abram gets this this revelation of Jehovah Jireh and and I don't know where you are I don't know what kind of a trial you may be going through but the promise that that is coming through and that Abram reveals to us is that God is a provider and and he provides what is the space and what is the place that Abram experiences this incredible provision it is in the place of intense testing. It's in the place of, 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 of sacrifice. It's in the place of surrender that he encounters God the provider. That it, that, and not just in name, he encounters the God who there's the ram in the thicket. And so, and so I want us to take courage from the story. God is a provider. He will provide for you and I. And just wanted to put up this this prophetic pictures and of and uh, of 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 the similarities between Abram and Isaac and what happened at the cross. Isaac's life as a picture of Jesus. Both were loved by their father. Both offered themselves willingly. Both carried wood up the hill of their sacrifice. Both were sacrificed on the same hill. Remember Mount Moriah highlighted that. Both were delivered from death on the third day. Can you see incredible similarities besides all the other prophetic declarations that he's made pointing towards Calvary? So let's just look on, look on what happens. Verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called to Abram in a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Third time your only son is mentioned. I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And as the sand that is on the seashore. Folks, look at this. You know, some people will, will, will look at this and say, Hey, okay, we need to find an altar because the result is blessing. I want God's blessing. I'll do anything for it. You know, the reality is. God is a blesser you, uh, he, in, in the biblical sense of the word. He blesses. And, you know, the reality is, despite your motive, God still blesses. The righteous and the unrighteous, He blesses. But it is still very encouraging to know that God is a particular, has His eye to bless those who are desiring to obey him and serve him and surrender their lives to him it is just bonus you know if we don't experience his blessing that's okay but it is just really encouraging that that he does bless those who wholeheartedly obey him what does this blessing look like let's look at it and your offspring shall possess the gates the gate of his enemies Verse 18, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So I want to highlight again, God's heart for the nations. All nations, again, we're part of every nation. This theme of all nations, you just find it throughout scripture. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And remember, God was looking through this little encounter. It was happening on Mount Moriah between Abram and Isaac. And he saw the nations. He saw you and me. He saw the multicultured nations of the world. 
So Abram returned to his young men, and they rose and went together. I've underlined the unity to Bathsheba, and Abram lived at Bathsheba. And I want to close with this. When God asked Abraham for the ultimate demonstration of love and commitment, he asked for Abram's son. When God the Father wanted to show us the ultimate demonstration of his love and commitment to us, he gave us his son. We can say to the Lord, Now I know that you love me, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And this, this story just points us back to the glorious, glorious work of Calvary. You can't read it as a, as a New Testament Christian and not just see all the prophetic pictures pointing towards Calvary. And it's pointing towards the fact that God provides. He provides a way. And I want to, I want to close in prayer, but I just also want to encourage you, the song that's really been on my heart as I was preparing and thinking about the song, is that song entitled New Wine by Hillsong. And we're going to put it in the playlist after this. And, and, I, and, I, and I want to encourage you to worship with that song because it's a song of sacrifice. It's a song of, of laying your life down. And it's a song speaking about the new wine that the Lord brings out of the crushing you know, when those grapes are crushed and etc. And what is the result? It's beautiful new wine that comes out. And so I want us to just worship. And just as you worship, I don't know if the story resonates for you more with maybe, maybe it's just the reality of Calvary and you just, I need to just acknowledge and surrender my life to Christ. Maybe you identify with just the reality of Isaac and, and you saying, sure, Lord, I need to get onto the altar. I need to surrender my all to you. Maybe you identify with Abraham and there's an aspect of your life, a very important aspect of your life that you're saying, sure, Lord, this is not under the Lordship of Christ. Lord, this, is, this, this aspect of my life is not bringing you glory and you want to bring that to the altar. I'm going to pray for you, but as we, as we sing this song, as we worship with this song, I want to encourage you to do so, to, to come to the altar and just to, to lay it down. And yes, we know there's blessing and God provides a way through this, but it all starts with us just coming to the altar. So let's pray. So Lord, this amazing story pointing to Calvary, Lord. It's just so rich, it's so deep. But it's also so real. I want to pray for every one of us, Lord. If you if you speaking to us about being an Isaac, about getting onto the altar. Lord, in scripture there's no indication that Isaac resisted it. A grown man resisting his old dad wouldn't have been pretty. There was none of that, Lord. He probably got on himself. His dad probably couldn't even lift him up there. So, Lord, we, we get onto the altar. We say we surrender. We give our all to you, Lord. That is the beautiful life, Lord. And, Lord, if there are things, if there are Isaacs in our life that are, that are not surrendered to you right now, we bring them, Lord, and we place them on the altar. We say they're yours, Lord. They're yours. Here it is, Lord. And so, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you are a provider. That's just who you are. And I pray for every single person who is coming to you and needs that reality, needs you to provide for an area. Lord, I just pray that you would provide. I just pray for breakthrough in provision for every single person who needs provision. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen.